have like options. A blue. I was able to just wait by there and grab the candle and just like get to everything. The electric front row. This is overwhelming from the front row. Oh, why not? Come on. I, 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 I promise I promise not to buy it. So you wouldn't grow anything. Or just speak to it. Usually in the front row, you have to be afraid. Yeah, you might get wet. <coughs> I promise not to do it too much. <laughs> I 
can forward you like one thing. Yeah. She goes, one of my friends did it to me and he said it's a car. I'm like, but mine wasn't as bad. I've been cleaning the house. Yeah, you look like you just like flying robot. Roll out of the chat. Roll out of the chat. I'm from this terrible angle where we're looking at the kitchen. I think it's really funny. What is Danny doing? Can everyone hear me? Oh, yeah. Okay. It's working. You go. Good morning. Happy to see a full room here today. Welcome to the Research Services Expo and the People's Memorial Lecture Series. Uh, we're really happy. This is the second year for the lecture series. And uh, a personal friend of Executive Director of Research Technologies and PTI, Craig Stewart, um, is here to present with us today. So we're very happy about that. Uh, Craig sends his condolences. He had a medical emergency, so here I am, um, the Manager of Education, Outreach, and Training for Research Technologies, filling in to introduce our speaker today. So um, without a lot of further ado, uh, Felix Bachman comes from Carnegie Mellon University, where he is a senior member of the technical staff at the Software Engineering Institute. Uh, his title today is, Is Software Eng Engineering Obsolete?, which I think is very um, a, could, could be a very compelling title, right? So I'm glad to see someone. Yes, it's a, it's a little scary title, right? Uh, so I'm really glad. He is the co-author of Attribute Driven Design Method and also um, is co-author of Documenting Software Architectures, Views and Beyond. And he's also a leading researcher on architecture design. So I think that he uh, came up with this great title and I think he's going to have a really good talk for us today. So thank you very much and thank you for coming to Indiana University. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Craig, for giving a wonderful talk. So first of all, wonderful good morning. I'm glad to have you here. Yeah, glad uh, I see interest in the topic, which is good. And first of all, I actually want to thank well, thank you and thank you, thank to the university, um, because you know, as you may may know, you know, sometimes it's difficult, you know, with all the work that we have for our everyday spaces. And, to take off some time, yeah, and think about or you know, write down the things that are really close to your heart, things that you want to move forward, where you want to have an impact. So fortunately, I got the opportunity here to talk to you today, and because of this, I had to take time off and had to think about, you know, what is it really that I want to tell you. When that title yeah, is software engineering obsolete. And that is something that is very bothersome to me on one part, but you know, also very challenging you know, to me. And I really would like to start a discussion in some way. You know, to start discussing that topic, you know, trying to figure out you know, do we really need to have something like software engineering, or can we just skip that and have a great time? Yeah. <laughs> so usually, you know, they say, you know, when you learn presentations, how to do presentations, and always start with a joke. I will skip that. <laughs> I won't start with a joke. I will give you a little bit insights yeah, into myself. A little journey, you know, from the past you know, to the future and what engineering actually, you know, especially software engineering, meant to me. Yeah. So having said that, you know, now I really have to do the joke thing. The joke is this one, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I have to make sure our lawyers are happy. Yeah. Which basically means here on that slide, saying no matter what I tell you, 
you cannot hold us accountable for anything. Yeah? No warrant at all. Yeah? So let you know what's going on. So, but now let me get to the topic here. Engineers. Let me get about 55 years back in the past. Um, you know, I mean, I see well, probably you now maybe a few, a couple of people who may remember those times. Do so you remember those alarm clocks? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. yeah, we had them. Right. Yeah. So at that time, I was about six years old. Yeah. And the good or the bad thing with those alarm clocks was they didn't last for a long time. Yeah. About, you know, a couple of months, three, four months. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then we were broke. And then we got new ones. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's what we did. Yeah. Which ended up in, you know, we had just quite a few of those alarm clocks which didn't work anymore. Now, imagine that. A six-year-old boy. How fascinating is that? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> to figure out, you know, what is actually in there. Yeah. So the first thing, when I could use a screwdriver, you know, so open up everything and take everything apart. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, so as soon as another alarm code was broke, yeah, I took that and figured out how does it actually work? Yeah. Of course, at that point, I was never able to put it back again. Yeah. <laughs> that took a few more years you know, until I actually put it back. And every now and then, you know, there were two or one or two which I actually could fix, which was very important. So that was, you know, from the very beginning, that's where I love to do. Yeah. Take things apart, trying to understand what it is, and trying to actually put together and fix things. Yeah. And then one thing happened. I saw this the first time. Yeah. Man, when I saw that thing, wow, what is this? Yeah. That's what I want to do. Yeah. Those are the things that I want to fix. Yeah, or feel yeah, and do. Mm -hmm. So I told my parents that, and the parents said, "Okay, well that that's great. Then what you'd have to do is you have to become an engineer. Engineer. Man, what was that? Engineer. I have to become an engineer. Oh, that was something so wonderful, you know, to me. Say, that's what I do." I want to become an engineer and do those things. Yep. Well, that was great. That was my first motivation you know, to become an engineer. From that point on, that was my goal. I need to become an engineer. But then, of course, as you probably know, life kicked in. Yep. When I was sort of like in the age that I could actually start thinking about those things, those didn't exist anymore. No? <laughs> yep. They were replaced you know, by you know, electrical locomotives and you know diesel engines and and those not that great anymore hmm? yeah. well they're functional yeah but that was gone yeah. saying well damn but i mean you know you're young the world is open and yeah now i didn't really have a direction anymore except of you know i still want to be an engineer yeah. and you know as you may hear from my accent i'm german so i grew up in german and at that point, you know, when I was at high school, we actually had engineering schools, yeah, school called engineer. Yeah. And of course, you know, that was my goal. Yeah. Go engineering school and do the engineer. Yeah. Now, again, unfortunately, you know, those politicians, the German politician decided at some point in time, why should we all have all those different schools? So engineering schools and colleges and universities and social and you know you, you name it. why should we have all of this let's just make one thing out of it let's call the colleges yeah so before i had the chance to become part of an engineering school they were gone yeah. it was a college now well a technical college yeah uh, but we're gone Thank you. Well, okay i guess that's 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 what it is yeah. But there's where you go. But what exactly to do? Now, fortunately, I was lucky. This is just by accident that I got an internship with IBM. 
So that was the first time you know, that I got in contact with a thing that's called computer. I had no clue what a computer is. So I asked my father, what's a computer? And he said, well, that's sort of like a mechanical brain. Oh, mechanical brain, that sounds interesting. Yeah, yeah I think I want to do that. So that pushed me towards becoming a software engineer. And so I worked with IBM, yeah, did my first programming. Yeah, maybe you know a 360. You no, know? yeah, that was my first one where I could work on. So, and that, that, that was cool. Yeah, so you know, you had those punch cards and you put some holes in there and you put it in there and something happened. That was great, yeah, wonderful. But now proud of myself. Yeah, of I'm now on the path to become a software engineer. I told everyone, yeah, and I still do that. Yeah. This is sort of like the reaction that I get yeah, when I tell someone I'm a software engineer. In the positive case, yeah, I get you know a polite, oh that's great. In the negative case, I get some, oh. <laughs> Software engineer, so you couldn't do anything else, huh? yeah. <laughs> something like this, which is, you know, very frustrating to me, because as I said, an engineer is sort of like you know the quintessential goal that you can have, you know, that you can become in your life, yeah, to become the engineer. And now I get that reaction. Yeah. That. Now looking a little bit into what happened. I think something crashed here. Great. Well, okay, while while you figure out, let me just talk about it. Yeah, unfortunately I have nice nice picture to have some fun with. So I started talking to you know different types of people, saying, okay, maybe I just have to talk to the right people. Yeah, to um, get the response that I expect, you know, something like, oh, you are so great. Yeah. So I started to work with project management. So there is, you know, from then I kind of like expected that well, project managers should be interested in engineering, right? Yeah, because it kind of like implies that you know what you're doing. I would think so. Yeah. Oh, there we are. Okay. Thank you. What was it? Okay. So I'll, I'll bring that one. Okay. Sorry about that. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Just leave again. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna have like all. Okay. So you, you just remember the, the last picture that was there. <laughs> that was the response of a project manager. Yeah. They see software engineering <laughs> as the black hole. <laughs> Yeah, for them, software engineering is a black hole. Yeah, it's sort of like okay, there is that period of time yeah, where nothing happens, and then maybe if you're lucky, yeah, at some point in time something comes out of it. Yeah, and sometimes it comes. Yeah, somewhere it doesn't. Yeah. So they were not happy. Yeah, with it. So then I I talked to software architects. How many of you know what an architect is? Software architect. Yeah, okay, a few. You know, okay, all right, okay, good. So, you know, with my job, I have to do a lot of, lot of those, those people. Yeah, those are the, you know, quintessential people who know how to deal with software. Yeah, so software architects would be engineers. So I talked to them. Here's a reaction that I usually get from them. You know, saying, um, stay out, stay out of my turf. <laughs> yeah. I know what you're doing. Trust me. Yeah. So don't cross that boundary. Yeah. Just I'll take care of whatever it is. Yeah, and you know, it'll be just fine. Yeah. So very often, you know, when I really, you know, cross that boundary and see what they do, they have good parties going on there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, but I mean, what I expected, I still couldn't get it. So I start talking to the developers. Developers have no interest at all. <laughs> no. Architects, engineering, no, here, what I want to do is write in code. Yeah. I have to do something. I want to do something real. Yeah. Yeah. Get rid of all the other things. Yeah. So let's pick your favorite language and let's do something there. That's what I hear from developers. They don't want to have be bothered with engineering. Yeah. They want to do things. I talk to students. <laughs> yeah. So CMU has a students for software, uh, software engineering, a master's program, yeah. master for software engineering. So I talk to them and saying, well, what does software engineering mean to you? That's what it means. It means, oh, I have to write a lot of documents and you know, we have you know, some supervisor that cracks the whip and makes us work. <laughs> Why would anyone want to be a software engineer? Yeah. Absolutely not. What we really want to do is do cool stuff. Yeah, this is what it was. Yeah. There are, you know, all those new things out there in the world. Mm -hmm. That's what you want to do. Yeah, forget that engineering thing. Mm -hmm. So really, it comes back to, it looks like we don't need software engineering anymore. Yeah. So why? Why bother? No one wants it. Yeah. You all want to do cool stuff. Yeah, so let's just do cool stuff. Have some fun yeah, with it. From you know, on the surface, when I look at that, saying that seems to be the answer that I get, which of course makes me very unhappy. So I ask myself the question again: Am I just too late? Yeah, I couldn't do those steam engines. Uh, I couldn't go into the engineering school, and obviously now I'm doing something that no one wants. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> yeah, talk about a screwed up life. Yeah. Same. Yeah. So, but looking at the landscape today, uh, what happens the last, let's say, about 15 years um, was that the number of challenges increased tremendously. Um, we are now talking about connectivity. Um, thinking in terms of you build a system somewhere and it's standalone, it's kind of like, why would you ever do this? Hmm? Systems today are connected and they will be connected more and more and more. Yeah? So it's not a single entity anymore. Yeah? It is an entity in a context. We start talking about ecosystems yeah? for certain things. Think in terms of you know, Apple. Yeah? You have all the Macs or the Mac store. Those are ecosystems. You know, it's not just software anymore. You know? There's whole markets behind it. You know? So big things. Scaling. Yeah. Uh, everything becomes big now. Yeah, no matter what, no matter what you do, you know, it's becoming big. You know? And a major challenge is you know, how do we build systems to make sure we can actually scale them up? Yeah. Think in terms of the Googles, the Netflix, the LinkedIn's, the Facebooks. You know? Scale is probably the most important problem that they have to tackle. Complexity, you know? distribution, you know? not everything in one, one place anymore. Huge amount of data you know, to move around. You know? You're probably familiar you know, with this. And you know, other technologies coming up. Yeah, so we just went through the cloud. Yeah. So the typical thing, every, everything has to become a cloud now. Yeah. Well, I mean, cloud provides you know, some nice feature, which is the elasticity. Yeah. That's, that's my thing. Uh, and the one who needs it is fine. Yeah. But nevertheless, every, everything had to become a cloud. Yeah. Before that was a SOA. Yeah. Now we have the SOAs in the cloud. Yeah. And of course, you know, in three years, there will be something else. Yeah, and it will get faster and faster and faster. You know, that those paradigm shifts happen. Yeah. And expected from us that we deal with it, that we feed that market, that we make it faster. Yeah. Things, new things happen, bump up. You know? Frameworks, you know? machine learning, DevOps. You know? But 
who knows what Dev, DevOps is? Oh, quite a few. Yeah. So basically, it means you know, a developer creates a feature and pushes out into operation quickly. Yeah. So today you write something, and tomorrow it's in production. Yeah. So it makes that happen for a system you know, where everyone relies on yeah, that it actually works. Challenge your problem. Yeah. And organizations are tackling it. This is fun stuff, isn't it? Yeah. So let's try to solve these ones and not those engineering things. Yeah. So looking at the landscape today, the challenging, you know, the challenges that, that we see at least for the next five to ten years is to deal with the scale, make everything scale up, speed. Yeah, speed in terms of developing new things. Yeah. Applications don't live that much that long anymore. Yeah. But we need to you get many out of that very quickly. Yeah. And it will get faster. So you know, a little bit for you young people here. You are you're growing up yeah, in the you know, instant reward environment. Yeah, you want to do something, you want to get instant feedback, instant reward. There. That has impact. When I teach classes, yeah, now I see, of course, the people get younger and younger and younger. Yeah, I get those responses. Yeah, responses of don't tell me too, too many of those details. Give me the big picture and we figure out the rest later. So that means you know, that generation, it's just a fact, need to be fed quickly yeah, with something. It will die yeah, again, but you will need to feed it. Evidence. Uh, how do you make, make sure that whatever you produce would actually work? No one can, if that complex system that we have you know, today, no one can give you any proof anymore you know, that whatever they do will actually work or does what is expected. Yeah? It can. It's way too complex. Yeah? But there are still people who pay the money for it and they expect something in you know, to get back. They want to be convinced that whatever they spend the money for, they will actually get that. So producing evidence yeah, for that whatever you do, it actually works. These are all the challenges. No one of us, no single person can deal with that challenges anymore. Yeah. We need to do specialization Everyone picks the little piece. Uh, it's like a puzzle there. And we really would hope that there is someone somewhere yeah, who knows how all those puzzle pieces actually work together. <coughs> and I mean, matter of fact, just look at, you know, look at your device that you have. Most of the things actually work. Yeah? So it does work. Yeah? <laughs> so that let me. Again, back in my life, let's go back about 25 years. 25 years ago, yeah, I got a wonderful chance yeah, to build the next generation yeah, of a system, with a switching system. Yeah, so, you know, when you know phones, so, I mean old-fashioned phones, not new-fashioned phones, old-fashioned phones, hmm, which have a landline, you know, where you have dial numbers, or actually touch numbers. So we got the opportunity to build the new generation, next generation system. We had all the education, we had all the freedom. We could come up with anything we wanted to. <coughs> yeah, man, that's so wonderful. If you ever have the chance, you know, for doing this, this means engineering the steam engine. Okay. You have the chance you know, to build it from scratch. You can, you know, throw away all the old paradigms, get some new paradigms in there, and make it work. Wonderful, wonderful experience. Except of, you have a boss. <laughs> Every week, my boss came to me and asked the question, saying, so, why is what you do better than whatever else we did in the past? Yeah, and I mean, young and proud as I was for myself, I said, okay, come here, I'll show you. And I showed him all those documentation. And you know, at that point was when object orientation came. So with all those nice diagrams, the boxes and the lines. 
So the, that was precursor to UML, yeah, but you know, close to this. So I showed him all the, you know, what the elements are, how they work and, you know, what they do and all of this. And my boss was very polite. He listened to me for about half an hour. And after the half an hour, then he said, so that means you cannot tell me why it's better. <laughs> okay. Damn, I just tried to. <laughs> Obviously, you didn't realize that. <laughs> okay, so, okay, so I, next week, next week you tell me, right? Okay. <clears throat> and we repeated that game week after week after week, and he never understood what I tried to tell him. Until one point in time, I was just sick of it. You know? And saying, okay, if you don't understand the details, hmm, come on. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Sometimes they work. Yeah. Sometimes they work. <laughs> yeah. So if you don't understand the details, then thank you. Yeah. Then I show you to that in PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah, this one, yeah, say there. Oh, so I created that picture. It says that if you look at the requirements and the system, and you look at how likely is it you know, that a change will appear, then you will see you know, it's much more likely that a change appears in the details than in the abstract, in the, in the generic part. So therefore, my boss, therefore we build something yeah, that gets rid away of, of the details because it will change anyway. Yeah, and we focus on the abstract thing. Yeah. That makes sense to them. Saying, oh, that's why you're better than the others. That's what I understand. Yeah. So that was the precursor to then us discovering, yeah, there is actually something that was called architecture. Yeah, with the intention of we really, let's focus on the the more abstract part, yeah, the more generic part, yeah, and not that much, you know, on the details. Have a whole discipline around it. Yeah. So people are writing books about it. Yeah. And really going through this, what we then also discovered is then wait a minute, there is an essential difference between thinking in terms of abstraction, what you can achieve, and coding. So meaning implementing the details. Um, there is an essential difference. And the difference is actually you know, what we call the quality attributes. Um, with the coding, you say what the system is supposed to do. You provide the functions. With the abstraction, you provide you know, the, how well those functions will actually perform. Yeah, how fast they are, how reliable they are, how scalable they are. Yeah. That's what you do with the abstractions. Yeah. You don't provide functions with it. Yeah. That's the, the structures. Yeah. The structure will determine how easy something is to change, yeah. how fast it will be running, yeah, and those. Yeah. That was a major discovery yeah, that um, we had. That was about, you know, as I said, 25 years ago. Yeah. We figured out you know, that that is the difference. Which they also said, well, functions are short-lived, most, most of them. They will change yeah, over time. The properties or the quality attribute properties that you want from, from that system, <laughs> they stay stable, well, at least to some degree. Yeah. So, Having something that focus on those and being able to control those properties. And what do you do to make something fast? What do you do to make something scalable? If you can go to Google and say, yeah, here's exactly what you need to do to get even bigger. Yeah, then you have a sure shot. Talk. Yeah. If you go to Google and saying, oh, I know something, uh, a new cool language now yeah, where we can you know, write new functions. Yeah. Well, that might be good too. Yeah. But not necessarily a secure job, yeah, because you are just one out of 10,000 yeah, who do exactly the same thing. But to solve a scalability issue or assurance issue or you know speed issue yeah, in terms of development speed, yeah, 
that gives you a job. So, and we started writing books about it. So now there's a whole set of, you know, different books you know, with all the different aspects that happens yeah, around uh, what became the term of architecture, software architecture. Yeah, in there. That was the world I felt comfortable with, saying, yeah, so if I really want to do engineering, that means I want to control what the outcome will be. And I want to be able to predict yeah, when you ask me today, saying how long will it take and what will I get, I will be able to tell you fairly precisely you know, what you will get. That's, by the way, what you expect from any other engineer, right? Yeah, you would not go to someone who builds bridges yeah, and say, well, uh, okay, start, start working on it. Yeah, and then we'll see what comes and then we'll fix whatever needs to be fixed. Yeah? <laughs> you would never do that. For software, we do that. We say, yeah, well, let's just get going and you know, do something, and then we'll see, yeah, and then we'll fix it. Yeah. And yes, I mean, software is easier to fix. Absolutely, I grant you that, you know, compared with physical things. Yeah. If you screw up the physics, there are firm laws you know, that apply. If you violate them, you violate them, it won't work. Yeah. The software is not that, that simple. So yes, it gets easier to change, but it costs money. Yeah. You spend a lot of money and time yeah, in, in fixing it. So what we then said, saying, okay, so it looks like what you really need to do yeah, is you know, to pave the road, yeah, is to build something that, that was called the architectural runway, which means before you develop something, yeah, so you create new functions, pave the road, yeah, make sure that you can build on top of that road easy. Quickly, yeah, whatever you need to do. Great. So we published that, yeah, and here was the response <laughs> saying, oh, okay, so what you're saying is you want to have this big design up front. So you spend that, you know, long time you know, for coming up with those, you know, yeah, I grant you great ideas, yeah, but we can't get anything. Yeah, so we have that black hole again. Saying, well, no, that's not really what we're talking about. Yeah. And we're talking about you know, to build that incrementally. Yeah. We know that we cannot know everything up front. Yeah. We know a few things, yes. Yeah. Let's focus on those ones. Yeah. And then start learning. Yeah. And then build on this. Yeah. Move ahead incrementally. Yeah. We know that we need to do that. That's not what we meant here, you know, build some water for this thing. What you really have in our mind is, as a matter of fact, requirements, the system design, the implementation, all will evolve in parallel, concurrently yeah, from each other. You can't hinder them. Even if you say, as a government organization, you can, saying, you do waterfall, right? So get your requirements here, and then we approve them. And then you do the design for that, and we approve it. And then you implement it, and we approve it. You know, that's how you have to work. You know? And many governmental organizations work that way. You know? And there are actually a few projects that were actually executed that way. You know? So they really followed the plan you know, you know, to the T, and at the end, they delivered. Now, unfortunately, all those systems were completely unusable. <laughs> And all the other contracts, you know, they were always changed. Yeah. So fact is, it will change. So we better deal with it yeah. and make it sure. Given that, yes, you have to start with the requirements. Yeah. You cannot build a system without knowing what to build it for. Yeah. But no one says that you have to have all of them. You only have just a few that's actually sufficient. Yeah. As a rule of thumb, we always say there are three things that you need to know before you can start building a system. First of all, you have to understand the context. Yeah. So what is the system that you're building for? You know, what is the system supposed to do? That context, you have to understand that. One. You have to have not more than five use cases. Five, handful. Why five? Because we are humans. 
yeah, as a human being, yeah, yeah, there might, might be some of you in there who can deal with more than five, but normal human beings yeah, can only deal with five things at, at a time. Yeah, that's all we can do. Yeah, so let's take that into account. Saying whatever whatever the problem is, yeah, we can only take yeah, into account five things. That's why we love hierarchies. That's the reason why we have hierarchies. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why we do classifications. Yeah, to put that in boxes. You know, to cut down the numbers. Yeah, because we are humans. Yeah? So, describe your system in five use cases. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. Major things. And yes, there will be hundreds of variants of those. Yes, we know that. Hmm? Yeah. But if you have five use cases, you have a pretty good understanding of what the, what the system does. And the third one that, that you need to have is five what we call quality attribute scenarios. Something that specifies those non-function properties. Yeah? How fast it be, how secure it has to be, you know, how easy to change, and such. Yeah? If you have that, and you can write it down on probably two pages. If you have that, you can start. Um, and the next step is then you start building your architecture. Yeah, you take what you have, yeah, design the system from what you have so far. And of course, yes, you know, you will change it. Yeah, so use tools for it. Yeah, and <clears throat> tool, I mean, don't mean a text document writing tool, whatever your favorite one is. Yeah, a tool that allows you to make changes, to maintain it, because you will have to change it. That's for sure. So you come up with the first design and then you feed your development. Yeah. They can, after you have some idea of what's going on, they can take the, the, the pieces which are most likely to happen and start implementing that. Again, of course, in such a way that you can easily change them because we know that they have to change. Yeah. Again, Use tools for it. And then you just repeat that. In the meantime, you know, the, the, your stakeholders, you know, whoever creates the, the requirements, build the next set of requirements, you know, which feeds in the next version of the architecture, which feeds in the next version of the delivery, and so on, and so on, and so on. You know? And it works just fine. So basically what happens you know, is this picture with discovering that we have something like the architecture, the software architecture, that helps us to control the outcome of the system, that helps us to control that whatever we implement is actually aligned to whatever the organization wants. Yeah? So we deliver what the Google wants, we deliver what the Netflix is want, yeah? or whoever it is, yeah. quickly. Yeah? That determines the success. So what is really going on is here you have cycles, yeah, going on, working around quickly, independent of each other, yeah, trying to solve the problem and trying to implement that. So that is our picture of saying, I don't have any problem with that. There is nothing complicated with it. Yeah, why can't we do it? Why are people always saying, oh, that is too formal? Yeah, let's just do something. And I'm not talking about a, a, a big delay here. Yeah, you will get out something very quickly. Yeah, yeah. But still, the picture is there saying, oh, that takes so long yeah, <laughs> to get there. Now, let me switch over to a concrete example. Yeah, I was sick of this, of those comments. You know, we can kind of like skip that software engineering. You know? Let's do some real work. Fortunately, you know, we got the opportunity to work with the Maxim Stock Exchange. Yeah. They came to us and saying, well, we need to build a trading engine. Yes, yeah, a stock trading engine yeah, for the Maxim market, yeah, which is a very essential system for the financial market in, in Mexico. And they came and saying, and we want to compete against the NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange. So they want to get, you know, a, a bit out of that flavor of, yeah, well, it's Mexico. Yeah. So we want to be, you know, up front. Yeah. We want to be the leader. So they set up saying, well, the first approach was, can you buy a trading engine somewhere? And they very quickly 
figured out, yes, they can, yeah, but if they buy that from the New York Stock Exchange, how much power would they have to convince them to implement their features that they want? If they would compete against them, there's even, you know, the, the risk there that they would say, yeah, yeah, that's a good feature. We'll get to that sometime, yeah, and never get, get to it. So they saw the risk and saying, well, yes, the only way how we can get out of it is if we implement the engine by ourselves. Um, we implement that. Unfortunately, they were honest enough, or well, fortunately, I should actually say, they were honest enough to admit that they don't know how to do it uh, and make sure that it works. Yeah, you cannot put out any piece of software you know, for the financial market, and then in the middle of the trading, you know, the engine goes down and nothing happens anymore. Mm -hmm. Immediately, you know, all the presses is descends upon you, and you will have all those wonderful comments everywhere. Yeah. You may be able to go through it once, but not twice or three times or even more. Yeah. Think in terms of the NASDAQ. I don't know if you if you heard. You know, it was about two years ago. There were quite a few uh, incidents you know, that, that happened there. Hmm? What kind of quest that had, you know? and how much they had to work you know, to make sure it doesn't happen anymore. Yeah? So that was their problem. So they came to us, fortunately, and saying, okay, help us. We need to build you know, the stock trading engine that is the fastest in the world, or at least can compete with the fastest in the world, and has to be reliable and scalable. Yeah, make that happen. Yeah, so that was their goal. Saying, okay, we can do that. Yeah, we can do that with your people. You don't have to hire you know, anyone else. Yeah, if you just yeah, go with us and apply software engineering principles. Let's engineer that system. Yeah, which we did. Yeah. Now they divided up the, the whole time you know, that they had for developing the, the system into cycles, what they call cycles. Now, cycles is not a sprint, it's not an iteration or something. You know? Cycles for them is something where they deliver something, something concrete. You know? And they said the first cycle, which took 14 weeks, in 14 weeks, we need to deliver a system that can do one type of trade. So the plain, normal, buy, sell trade. You know? But it has to be able to do it. So they need to be able to show you know, to everyone else that they actually know what they're doing in the speed that is required. That was the first cycle. Now that picture here shows you know, the amount of effort that went into different tasks like requirements, architecture, detail design, coding, testing. As you can see here in the first 14 weeks, the amount of work they spend into the requirements is very minor. The reason for that is, you know, because they had the requirement and says, and you do whatever the old machine or all the engine do. Yeah? So that's pretty easy requirement. Yeah? So you don't really have to talk that much. Yeah? So at that point, they had the requirements. Okay, we have to do whatever else they need to do. You can see that they spend quite some time into the architecture, but even more time in the detail design. Yeah, so detail design means to create all those UML diagrams. How many of you, when you implement, actually do this? Probably not that many, yeah, very seldom. Yeah. But there is one paradigm that for some reason we still don't want to admit to. For a developer, for someone who implements, yeah, we absolutely assume that they use a formal language, Java, you know, you name it, whatever your, your favorite language is, which is compilable, so you can check for errors, yeah? uh, and you can generate your code. You use, of course, IDEs, you know, some kind of like development environment. Yeah? That's what you do, and you write your tests uh, and run them. You know, that's expected from a normal developer, yes. For some reasons, we think that architecting is something special. Yeah, something where, you know, some people can come together, talk, have a great time, draw some nice pictures on the wall or the whiteboard, yeah, and that's it. Yeah? And then leave the rest to the others you know, to deal with it. 
And then, of course, the response of the others is always, that is so high level, we can't do anything. They didn't think it through. Uh, they had the problems, the devil is in the details and such. Yeah, that's the outcome from that. Why do we think yeah, that the work that architects do have to be less precise than the works that, that implementers do? Yeah, the people who write the code. Yeah, the impact of doing the wrong thing on the architectural level is even much higher yeah, than it would be on the coding level. Yeah. So there is no reason, no reason at all, yeah, why it should be less precise. The level of detail is not that high. Yeah. But whatever level there is, you know, whatever level you decide you know, your architecture is supposed to be, that level has to be consistent, precise, no bugs in there, would be nice if it would have compilers you know, that could run on top of it. Yeah. Yeah. There are some languages where we actually can, but UML, unfortunately, is not supporting it, and such. Yeah. And yes, of course, you know, there are IDEs, development environments you know, for those. Hmm? Yeah. There are all the UML tools out there. Yeah. Yes, I grant you, UML tools are not the best tools you know, for doing architecture work, yeah. but it's still better than nothing. You know, or writing word document yeah and I don't know who how many of you actually know a little bit about exceed um, if you look at the architecture document of exceed which is a huge document written in Microsoft Word or actually Google Google Docs <laughs> um, <coughs> unmaintainable um, impossible you have to do something with it so that's what they did they clearly said, okay, 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 we, we get it, we get it. Yeah. Architecture work has to be formal yeah, at that level, has to be precise. So that's why they wrote the detailed, um, um, the detailed, detailed design here. Yeah. And while they were doing that, we were actually coding. They wrote code here. Every time when something was clear, yeah, at least the interfaces, yeah, maybe not the content, yeah, so some of the elements. Yeah interface clear content I don't really know they took that and implemented the interfaces yeah, around it get feedback say okay would it work did you think about everything yeah, because you know the more you go in the details the more you learn that you should have done something different yeah. the next cycle yeah there they said okay we now have the one where we can one trade yeah and now we want to have it in such a way that it actually has a failover yeah because it has to be reliable in there. Now, all of a sudden, we have a spike in the requirements. They had to start thinking about what does fail over mean? Yeah, and what do we fail over? What not? And when do we do it? And how do we do it yeah, in those? So a lot of requirements work, which, of course, ended up in a lot of architecture work yeah, for doing that. A lot of design work. Yeah, not that much in terms of coding. Yeah, and they didn't even have to do almost no test yeah, in here. So after that was in place, and saying, okay, so now the next one is we want to have more of those different types of trading things. So instead of the simple one, now we have something like stop orders, limit orders, and such. Yeah. With that again, you know, required requirements work to figure out how it actually really should work. Yeah. At that point, the architecture was actually pretty good. You know, saying we don't have to touch it anymore. We have, of course, put the detailed design and start coding. Yeah. Now we have to see his coding here. Yeah. And then they had to make a break. They made the decision to um, use Java. Yeah. But they also want to have high performance. So every one of you who implement Java knows you know, when it comes to performance, there is that garbage collector. Yeah. As soon as the garbage collector kicks in, everything stands. They can't afford it, you know, that that happens. You know? So they have to be able to run the whole system over the day you know, without garbage collector kicking in. And that was for them an architecture problem, not the decoding problem. You know? It is an architecture problem you know, because now it requires guidelines to every developer saying here are things you can do and here are things you cannot do. You know? So they took that time off you know, to clean it up and say, okay, here's how we deal with the garbage collector. Because at that time, they had enough code to figure out where all the consequences are. 
Yeah? And then next one is now we have all the basics there, implement the full system yeah? heavily yeah, on, the, on the coding side. And then next one heavily also on the testing side. Yeah? Not that much on the architecture anymore. But no matter what cycle it is, no matter what the goal was, all the activities were always running in parallel. Yeah? Sometimes more, sometimes less, yeah? but everything was running in parallel and the requirements always changed. Um, and this, people had to deal with it. That was the outcome. Cool. Yeah. The goal was, you, know, you need to be able to do a trade in a millisecond. Cool. Yeah? What they achieved is an order of magnitude more, yeah? 100 microseconds. Um, throughput had to be done 1,000 transactions per second. They achieved 200,000. Um, the more important number is actually this one here. Um, the plan was 18 months. Um, they were finished in 17 months. Did more functionality because in the meantime, of course, you know, they learned what they had to do. So they more what, what they forward. So the only one who was unhappy here yeah, it was a pizza store around the corner. <laughs> yeah. Usually, you know, when the deadlines come up, yeah, the people do overtime, so pizza is delivered. Yeah. So you can measure the success of the, of the project in number of pizza slices that were sold. <laughs> <laughs> they went on vacation. Yeah. They didn't do anything there. So, yes, it does work. Yeah. We have clear evidence that if you do it right, you, know, you can actually achieve great things, and especially for the people, yeah, great things. But it's all about choices. You have to make decisions. And, you know, you know decisions, you know, as soon as you make a decision, you know there's a certain percentage that was just wrong. Yeah? Unfortunately, you don't know it. So that's why many people are kind of like paralyzed saying, okay, we have to decide something, but we don't know what the right thing is. Therefore, we don't make a decision. Not making a decision is much worse than making a decision, making the wrong decision. Um, as long as you keep in mind that whatever you do, whatever decision you make, um, you probably will have to go back yeah, and revisit that decision again um, and change it because you did something wrong. But again, that's because we are humans. Um, every one of us. Yeah, make mistakes. No one yeah, will make the right decision. By accident, yes, we will make the right decision. That's true for all of us. Yeah? So no matter what your knowledge is, no matter what your experience is, yeah, you will make decision and a certain percentage of those are just plain wrong. Yeah? So take that as a given, saying, well, you are really not sure what decision to make, but neither is he and neither is he. Yeah? So you can make a decision that you want, which gets the burden off of you. As long as you take into account, put a mechanism in place that says, I have to very quickly be able to discover if the decision that I made was the right one or the wrong one. And if it was the wrong one, I need to fix it. Yeah? But quickly, not a year later. Yeah? That's too late. As soon as you put that mechanism in place, your life becomes easy. Again, that's what I expect from an engineer. Yeah, to have an easy life. I want to have fun. Yeah, I want to do cool stuff. Yes. Yeah, but I want to have fun too. I have a family. Yeah, I love my family. Yeah, I want to spend some time with them. Yeah. So it boils down to trying to answer the question: How do you know that you did the right thing? Yeah. Given the circumstances that you pretty much know that you probably thought didn't do the right thing. Sometimes you do. So now let me walk a little bit more into the detail. Yeah, so I can I can give you a complete software engineering lecture in one and a half hour yeah, that will take a few semesters to go through. But let me go at least a little bit more into the detail about what are all those steps are yeah, that you go through, what the most important things are, and how can you make sure for yourself that you actually know what the right things are. Yeah? Let me go back to that picture. You know, the architecture is in the middle, yeah, and you control the outcome, you know, the properties of the system by controlling the architecture of the system. 
the first, you know, first task always starts with make clear what the problem is. Okay. And that is also the first task where many organizations already fail. So often, you know, are we called in? You know, so I mean, unfortunately, and normally people call us in when something is broken. Okay. They can't fix it themselves anymore. Very often, one of the reasons is they did try to understand what the problem is. They had a customer saying, oh, the system is slow. <clears throat> Someone, you know, also the developer said, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, we fix it. Yeah. They put something in place which supposedly fixes it. It didn't fix the problem and create another problem. Yeah. So the problem got worse. Yeah. Because no one were actually sitting down yeah, and figuring out saying what really is the problem. Yep. This morning, a few people here, we had actually a nice conversation. Yep. For you know, every every time you want to solve a problem, the very first thing need to be you have to make that problem visible. Yeah, and with visible, I really mean visible. You have to see it yep. in some way. If the customer says the system is slow, before you touch anything yeah, to fix it, put something in place that really shows the system is slow. Yes. And it is slow when I do exactly this and not when I do some maintenance work or whatever, whatever it might be. Yeah? Produce the numbers that you can see them. Oh, when I measure here, then this number is 10 seconds and that is too slow. Make it visible. Because if you see the problem, each of you can fix it. Yeah? Immediately. You, know, you see, okay, this, this component here is slow. Yeah, here's the number saying, okay, well, then we have to do something here. Yeah? So formulate the problem in such a way that you can state how would the system would look like when the problem is fixed. Yeah? again, in a measurable way. So you see what it is now, you put a fix into, into the system, and you do the measure again, and you see what, what's after that, after that fix. And hopefully that number is now better as it was before. Yeah, achieve the goal that you have. So it always means um, that no matter what you do, yeah, no matter what problem you try to solve, if you cannot articulate um, how the world would look like when the problem is fixed, then don't even start working with it. Yeah, because all the, the time you invested in trying to fix that problem is wasted. Um, it will not get you anywhere. But I shouldn't say that. You could, you might be lucky. Um, and you really, you know, you fix the right part. Yes, those happen. Hmm? But more likely not. Um, so that's the very first, first step. And many organizations already fail here. Uh, in trying to state what it is that needs to be done. And again, I'm not talking about weeks. You know, I'm talking about maybe a couple of hours. Sometimes it's a little bit more. You know, sometimes they are tough problems. You know, if you, you know, they are sporadic. You know, there may be race conditions, something like this. You know, so that's, that's more difficult. But it's also more difficult to fix. You know? And if you try to fix something, you know, then more likely you, know, you put something in place and you see uh, it didn't solve the problem. It still happens. Yeah. So yes, for some of the problems, it will be difficult to come up with a measure, how you make it visible. Yeah. But most of the problem, at least the 80%, yeah, it's very easy to put something in there. You may already have that number. Yeah. Maybe it's you know, some analysis in the log files you know, to get some information out of it. Yeah. To have that yeah, and can see something. And then make a statement of what it is that need to be done and how it would look like afterwards. Yeah. That's the first thing. Here comes the other thing. The plan. Create a plan. Yeah. I just want to fix it. Now I, you know, I have, I can see what the problem is. Now let's dive into it and fix it. Yeah. And now this Felix character comes and saying, create a plan. Why so? Yeah. <coughs> well, 
Not when it comes to easy problems, but when it comes to a little bit more difficult problems, especially, you know, I'm now talking about something that might be an architectural issue. Uh, and if something is an architectural issue, you know, the effort that is um, combined with it might be higher than usual. You know, something has to change. Maybe some interface has to change. If interfaces have to change, then everyone who's using the interface has to change. So there might be things you know, that need to be considered. So that typically means you go to your management and say, yes, we can fix it, and it will take four weeks to do so. And of course, what's the reaction of the management? That's way too much. <laughs> Can't you do that tomorrow? Yeah? Or maybe in a week. Yeah? They don't want to pay that. They think you as a developer, you just want to have a good life. Yeah? <laughs> so you push the boundary and saying, if we say four weeks, you really only do need two days. <laughs> but management will cut us down anyway. Yeah? So they will probably go down to you know, two weeks, but then we have still have enough power buffer if something bad happens. We have to deal with it. That's how we think. Yeah? The managers know that. <laughs> they know exactly you know, that you think that way. Thing. Okay, so when you say four weeks, you probably mean two weeks, and then you have a buffer of one week in there. So I ask for one day. <laughs> <laughs> so and maybe I end up with then with, with a week. And why is it so? Because we cannot provide any evidence that whatever we say is true. When I say it will take four weeks, then I don't usually have evidence that shows you know, that really it will take four weeks. And we don't have that evidence because we never create a plan. Yeah? So just to be able yeah, to provide enough evidence that we can get to our managers yeah, and saying, you know that when I say four weeks, you know from the past, it always took four weeks, right? I was always on the mark. So today I tell you it will take five weeks. So Here's the evidence you know, that will show you, you know, that yes, I'm right. It will take five weeks, like it or not. Yeah, it will take that much. That comes when you create the plan, when you put your efforts in there. Yeah? And yes, of course, your first plan will be wrong. Yes. Yeah? But over time, you will start collecting data. You make the problem of estimation visible visible to your manager. Yeah? So over time, they start trusting you, saying, OK, I won't trust you, but you always, <laughs> you always give me the right numbers. So I guess when you say, well, then it'll probably do. Yeah? Just for that purpose. Yeah? Put the estimates in there and track and see how your estimates work. Yeah? And then over time, learn from it yeah? to get it. Management really isn't evil. But you have to convince them, give them the right information, yeah? the information they can act on. Yeah? That's what expected. Yeah? Why should you trust? Why should they trust you yeah? if you never provided them and you know, create the basis for trust? Yeah? So, but again, how do you know that you have the right plan? Yeah? Well, actually, I can guarantee you that you don't have the right plan. Yeah? So, no matter what, again, that's a given. Yeah, because it requires, we as human beings, it requires to look ahead into the future. Yeah, well, there are likely things that probably will happen, but no one of us has assurance that that is exactly what happens. Yeah. So, yes, of course, it will be wrong. Yeah. But we started you know, creating, given the, given the guideline, we pre provided the framework where we can start you know, collecting the numbers and figuring out how the world actually will be. And I mean, there is a reason why project manager put buffers in there. Yeah? Because they know it is very normal that unexpected things will happen. And therefore, you need to have that 20% buffer yeah, in there. Works overall, average works just fine. Yeah? Do a loss. Where does the 20% come from? From tracking, estimation and tracking. Yeah? When you know, developers work for me, and I asked them, okay, how long will something take? Yeah, and I knew you. I could always say, yeah, so whatever number you say, yeah, only 60% of that is correct. So I added the 50 to 
to it. Yeah? And that was pretty, pretty precise yeah, at the end. Yeah? Just to have that number is a great thing. Get your own numbers. Yeah? Everyone, every number of, of each of you is different. Yeah? So get your own ones. Then comes the design. That's the fun part. Now we can say, okay, here's how we solve that problem. Yeah? That's the fun part. And you know, I, I grant you, all of you, you can solve the problem. If you can see it, you can solve it. But the interesting piece is all of your solutions will be different. Yeah? There is no one solution you know, that you know, is there which solves the problem. There are many solutions that solve the problem. Yeah, so now why is your solution better than yours or yours or yours? Why that? So the problem with design um, is not really coming up with, with the solution. The problem with the design is more like thinking in terms of options, alternatives. Yeah? What are the possible ways you know, how we can, can solve a problem? Yeah, and again, I have to come back to us humans. You know that we as human beings, we have a limited point of view. We don't see the whole world. We just see a little bit of that world. Yeah? And of course, we are very comfortable in our world. And all the solutions that we come up with are the solutions that map to our world. Yeah? But a better solution might be just outside, outside of the world that we understand. Yeah? But that might be your world. You could come up with that. So every one of us yeah, in how we see the world are very limited. The only way how we can get rid of it is to work as a team. Have at least two people. I love to work with four people. Yeah, four seem to be an ideal number. I don't know why, yeah, but it seemed to be an ideal number. Yeah. And just go through and say, okay, how would you solve the problem? 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 Just create a list yeah. Yeah, of, of those. Create, create a list of all the options. And then ask, okay, so why would you solve the problem? Yeah, if it's your solution. And if it's his solution, I would ask you and say, okay, why wouldn't it solve the problem? What do you think? Yeah. What are the risks that come with it? Yeah, because again, we love to think in terms of solving a problem and not in terms of what else is it that we just violated. You have the risks that come with all solutions. And every, every solution has risk. There is no fear you know, for it. But it's much better to ask other people what the risks are of that solution. And then we go through. So what's good with your, what's bad with it? Yeah. How much does it cost? What's the benefit? High, medium, low yeah, in there. You have immediately a very you know, unemotional discussion based on facts. And now you have a nice list of possible options. The reality is the option that you will go for is usually a combination of those. So we take a little bit of your solution, combine it someone, somehow with your solution, yeah, and a little bit, some aspect of that on top of it. Yeah, and that's what we're going for. So and now instead of having a very limited solution, you know, that would solve from your perspective, we actually have a much broader one that would really solve the problem yeah, in there. So beside all the de design work, if you can get you know, to the point where you can create those options, great. Then you actually start solving the problem. Yeah. But again, how do you know you have the right ones? Here comes the one. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry, at some point in time, whatever solution is, we have to write it down. So some documentation is needed. Yeah? And yes, I grant, we all hate it. And we don't want to do it. But the problem is, although you work now, let's say with four people to create that solution, yeah, and those four people will be convinced, yes, that's the right solution, we can just go forward. You still can go to anyone else and convince them saying, yes, we have a solution. Can you go to your customer yeah, and say, we solve the problem, here's what we will do, that will solve your problem. Yeah. Can you convince them? Can you convince an expert? So think, think back in terms of the trading engine. 
Yeah, the stakeholders want to have that one millisecond. Yeah, before you move on yeah, to implement all those shiny, great, wonderful things, hmm? convince me that you can do the one millisecond. Yeah. So, yes, we have to create the documentation. But think yeah, it is not about creating documentation. And it is about providing evidence that your solution is the right solution. You only have to write down what makes your case. And it can, can provide this. Here's how it works, and therefore it will solve that problem. That's all you have to do. From the you know, possible amount of documentation that you possibly could create, there is that much, not even 10% yeah, of it. So whatever it is you know, that you need to write down to make the case that you, the, the problem is solved, that's what you have to do. Yeah? But as I said, think yeah, of what it is. So put it together yeah, in a case, instead of having those huge documents or so kind of like encyclopedia yeah, of things, yeah, which my system is, yeah, which is very hard to read. Yeah, because you have to read a section over here and you know something in the appendix and there is another section yeah, which also has to deal with it yeah after some time no one knows anymore you know, how that all is together so even if it might be written down i may not be able to find it anymore and make the case that yes the problem is solved so organize it you know, in some way again if you have a tool yeah, that helps you. Especially, I mean, there are wonderful UML tools in there that allows you to generate documentation yeah, after different criteria. Yeah. So, okay, only show me this piece you know, and put all, all this information together. So everyone who wants a piece of documentation for a certain specific case, you can just write the script, here's what you do, push the button, and there it is. Yeah. You don't have to maintain it. Yeah, the tool maintains it for you. So organize in terms of making the case yeah, for it. And then comes the uncomfortable part. Yeah. So no, you are now all happy yeah, by just creating that documentation that makes the case. You are even more convinced now that you have the right, the right solution. Yeah, you can solve the problem. Got it. But again, you are now maybe four people. It might be a good idea yeah, to have someone else look like, especially when you solve a tough problem. Let's say you try to solve a scalability problem. You, know, you need to be able to scale something up you know, very quickly and unlimited. So although you may have the, the information, might be a good idea to talk to someone who actually knows how to do with scalability, which might be not one of yours. Yeah, so maybe, you know, one of Google would be great. Yeah, all those companies who actually have the scalability problem. And yeah, one of those experts yeah, would be great yeah, to have them in place. Yeah, and try to convince that expert. Think, here's what we do to deal with the scalability. Yeah, and convince the expert. And the expert says, okay, makes sense. Yeah. Then you have, you know, high assurance yeah, that you, you got it. Again, I'm not talking about days and days of work. I'm talking about a couple of hours. Um, if you cannot convince an expert that you have a solution within one hour, yeah, then you don't have a solution. Yeah. So try to do that. If you can do it, you know, very briefly, you know, get someone in there, convince them, and in an hour they say, yes, you're right. Then you got it. If you can't do that, then you know you have to go back to your drawing board and think it through. Something is wrong you know, with those solutions. It was actually an observation of a project manager. You know, I couldn't come up with that. You know, I wasn't that smart. The project manager was actually sitting there and observing when we do, did a review. And at the end, saying, OK, so we had a couple of, of reviews that failed. And for all of those reviews, we spent about one and a half hour so at one half hour, we had to say, okay, it failed. Everything else that was passed, yeah, was definitely not more than one hour. 
Yeah? So Porto may not observe that. And yeah, I think that's a pretty good observation. Yeah? So let's take that as a guideline. Convince someone within an hour, if you can do, great. An expert, an expert, sorry. Yeah? And then of course, you know, either go back or move on. So, but coming up with a solution, to design a solution that would solve the problem, yeah? these are the steps that you go through you know, to make it happen. Great, so now we have a solution. Finally, now we can implement it, right? Well, yes, sort of. Yeah, unfortunately, from the documentation perspective, what we documented so far was what was needed to make sure we can make the case that we have a solution. We did not document how to implement it. Yeah? And there is still, you know, infinite possibilities how we can implement a solution yeah, of that. Now we have to limit it down. So there are certain guidelines that the developers need to have yeah, to make sure you know, that they do the right thing, especially you know, when it comes to performance. A one single line of code you know, can kill your whole performance. Yeah? Think in terms of garbage collector. Yeah. You have just that one, you know, dynamic creation of an object yeah, somewhere hidden in the code, and because of this, the garbage collector kicks in, in the middle of the day yeah, and holds the engine. Yeah. So there have to be guidelines. They have to be written, unfortunately. Yeah. So you start creating additional documentation. But again, the purpose of that documentation is to tell the, the one who implements the, the solution exactly what they need to do to the degree, to the details they need to do. Give them freedom, yes, but certain things are not free. So how to deal with the garbage collector is not free. Yeah? You can't do anything you want to. Other things are free, you can do whatever you want to. Yeah? That still has to be created. Interface descriptions, yeah? something like this. Sequence diagrams, yeah, that tell them, here's how this will go through, here's how your piece has to act. Yeah, in general, not in the details, in general. Yeah, ES has to go. Again, if you know what the purpose is of that documentation, you should be able, you know, at least for a package you know, for a developer, to create that documentation package within half a day. Yeah, again, I'm not talking weeks or months, such. Yeah. So, then we have it. Great, wonderful, now we're done, right? Uh, well, again, we did a piece of work, we created that documentation. How do we know that that was the right thing you know, that we did? How do we know that we create the, the right documentation that helps the developers? We believe so, yes, but we don't really know. Well, now we have a communication problem. And whoever is implementing it, if it's not you, with you, yourself, great. You know everything, you can just go ahead and move. Larger organization, there is someone else who will have to implement that solution. And now we have to explain yeah, to that someone else yeah, how to do that. And make sure, since it's not you, they probably will do it wrong. At least that's what you think. <laughs> At that point, you don't consider that you may have done it wrong. Yeah? So far, it's them, they will do it wrong. Yeah? So what can you do yeah, to make sure they do it right? So we have something that we call the active design review. Yeah. Yes, of course, you could give the, you know, whoever is implementing, you could give them the document. Here, I wrote everything down, here's everything, just take it yeah, and implement as it was here. I mean, you know <coughs> that whatever you do, you can never write a piece of documentation you know, that is unambiguous, clearly understood, yeah, only lets yeah, allows for one path forward. No one can. Yeah? There's always those, those ambiguities in there. Yeah? Something that can be misinterpreted, yeah? always there. So just giving the documentation won't work. And especially when you do that to, to a developer would say, okay, that's great, good. Yeah. Put in the door, saying, okay, now let's just have some fun and do some work. So an active design review checks actually the purpose of the documentation. If the documentation is good enough for the designer to understand. And the best way to do it is 
get the developers in and give them a job. And saying, okay, you are responsible for doing this piece here. Here's the use case. Yeah, you know, they chose you know, what the system has to do, you know, or your piece has to do to make it happen. So now please take about an hour time, sit down, write down what you think you need to do. Yeah, how you would have to implement that. You have one hour. After that hour, you just tell me. Yeah, here's what I think I need to do. Yeah, and then you can check against the saying, yeah, that's what I would have expected. Yeah, so yes, you're right. You understand the documentation. Yeah? So go and do it. Um, or no, it's not right. Um, and of course, at that point, the developers will come up with saying, and um, by the way, you didn't talk about this interface here. Yeah, so how should that work? And yeah, didn't give me the information. So the architect yeah, will discover that he or she made mistakes too. Um, and now you fix it yeah, and can move, move on, go forward. Now, finally, <laughs> Yeah, finally we are there. Yeah, we implement it. Mm -hmm. Let me go back to reality here. Yeah? Many organizations do think implementing means doing having a language. Yeah, using Java. Or you know, you pick your favorite language. Yeah? I can assure you, you yeah, know, language doesn't matter anymore. Yeah? Yes, of course, yeah, you have to have a language. Hmm? But you probably have many of those languages. Yeah. If you, especially when you're in the web development, yeah, at the very minimum, yeah, you have to have have to know five languages. That's the minimum. You probably have to have more than that. So language is not the problem anymore. The frameworks are the problem today. Your value as a developer, yeah, is now how well do you understand those frameworks that you have to use, not the language. You know, that you use. So take that into account. But also, you now have, you know, to deal with that architecture crap here. You know? So which limits your freedom. Um, so really, I mean, when you look at that, would you want to be a developer? Well, actually, you may. You know? What does it buy you? You get now some kind of like framework. You know? But the intention of all of this is to make your life easier, simple, yeah. make it quick, have time for your family, yeah. spend there and not in coding or testing or you know, whatever that is. And yes, it does work. Yeah. It makes the job easy. And the less you have to code, the less mistakes you make, the less tests you have to go through, the less bugs you have to fix. Yeah. The number of bugs that you insert in the code yeah, is a constant. Yeah? Would be actually a good idea yeah, if everyone, when you, when you write code, would actually collect numbers yeah? and says, yeah, how many lines of code do you write before you insert a bug? If you have that number, yeah, I can assure you, it is a constant. Yeah? So my number is 42. That means when I write 42 lines of code, I have one bug in there. So I can immediately say, yeah, if I have to write a thousand lines of code, you know, then you can you make them out. I'm too old for that. It's a number of bugs I will have in there. Yeah, you can't avoid it. It's in there. The less code you write, the less bugs you have. So take that into account. But then again, problem here is now you code everything. How do you know that you did the right thing? There is something that we call architecture drift. Yeah. Architecture is what the architect told the developers yeah, to how to implement. And the developer tried to do his or her best. Fact is, there is some diversion from it. Either because the architecture was wrong, yeah, it just really didn't work, and yeah, so the developer fixed it. Great. Yeah. Or it was just unintentionally, I just forgot. Yeah, I forgot that I cannot call a method over here directly. I have to go via another component to do so because the IT just said so. Yeah. So there are multiple reasons why the drift will be there, but the drift is there. Yeah, always is. So why not having a conformance review? Again, I'm talking an hour. 
yeah, and something that can be supported by tools. There are tools out there where you can put the architecture specification in there and the tools read the code and check the dependencies and try to check for violations. There are tools in there. Yeah, just use them. Yeah, then you know. And within an hour, you, you know if your code conforms to the architecture or not. Yeah, and then you can think about should the architecture change or should the code change? Yeah. So if you have to change something, go back. Yeah, if not, fine. That's the, the way how the implementation cycle looks like. So putting it all together, yeah, this is what software engineering actually looks like. Yeah. Going through cycles, going, getting the feedback quickly. Yeah. Making sure we discover what was done wrong quickly so we can fix. We are all human beings, no matter what your salary is, yeah, we still make mistakes and we all know that we do. So just accept that. Yeah. So as a conclusion, yeah, today I'm still not really that happy, yeah, but at the very minimum, if we just use software engineering as a means to the end, not an end by itself. So it's not about software engineering. Um, it is to have you know, an environment that allows us you know, to build, to, the, to solve the challenge that we have today you know, quickly, correctly, um, to move on, to have some great stuff. You know? That's what, what we need to have. Which means for universities, uh, and I'm not just looking here, all universities, that includes CMU. What I really would expect is that every computer science undergraduate student has the tool set of software engineering already trained. Yeah? They know all those things yeah? and they can use it. So they can use it efficiently to solve the problem of tomorrow. My last thanks, what I just said here, it's not just my work. Yeah, it's the work of many. Yeah, many here at the at the Software Engineering Institute. So I'm just you know standing on top of them yeah, and getting every, everything together. So my special thanks go to those people and many more. Yeah. And that concludes my talk. Any questions? How many time do we have? Some time? Yeah, we do for some questions. Absolutely. Okay. Kurt. Kurt? I actually have a ton of questions, but, <laughs> um, but also, I mean, sorry, um, after that talk, I do have time. Yeah, so any one of you, you know, invited that want to talk to me about something, specific problem, happy to do so. Yeah. Um, so most of mine are, are uh, generally do with uh, bounding scope, um, and so there are lots of questions related to that. Um, so the first one, just going back, I'll just taking order. Um, going back to your example on the banking thing, yeah. mm -hmm. weeks, um, and one of the things I noticed about those uh, those periods were they variated between each yeah. other. Like, mm -hmm. And so as opposed to um, uh, agile uh, Being time like boxed. Scrum where you know you have fixed length. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions I had was what's the relationship between the scope of the work being done in that period and what determined the length um, as well. Right. Okay. So what I didn't say is beside of the cycles, they also had iterations and the iteration were two weeks. Okay. Yeah. So within that. that actually was another question. Right. Okay. So what determined the, if it is 10 weeks or 15 weeks or so, you know, was it deliverable? Yeah. It was a deliverable where the stakeholder said, this is really what I need to see. I don't really care what you do in between. Yeah. But this is what I need to see. This is the, you know, you have to convince me, you have to assure to me that you're actually on the right path. Because still, as a manager, I don't trust you. You tell me all those great things, and you have those smart guys from, from the SEI, but I don't trust them either. Yeah. So you have to convince me. And those were the times. Saying after 14 weeks, you convinced me that you can run the first trade tool you know, in the speed that I require. Yeah. And then, you know, that, that determines. Within that period, yeah. then of course, yes, we had time box. Yeah. And those, those two week cycle or two week iterations, those are the ones where you have the hour performance. Yes. And those, yes. those kind of. Yes. Um, yes. 
folly attributes. Yes. Using yes. <laughs> yeah. So now it, it was from from our perspective. Now, you know, we have to coach the people you know, to become better in software engineering and make everything happen. And then again, I mean, at the beginning, at least, yeah, they were unexperienced, didn't really have a crew. Yep. So we had to make sure yeah, that they always are on the right track. Yeah? So we could not work with them every day. Yeah? That was just not possible. Mm -hmm. So what we then said, okay, well, we show up every two weeks. Yeah? And each, each, if, if period, yeah, you take two scenarios or use cases, mm -hmm. You work through, you do the design and the, the detailed design and you know provide all the evidence, everything I, I said here. And you know, every two weeks we sit together and we do the review, you know, and you convince us. Yeah, you know, like this. So we always had a day for reviews and then a day for and here's the next thing. Yeah. So we had to have that to really make sure that if they went astray, it was not too far. So we could pull them in again, you know, go in the right direction. Um, this, this may be a big picture question, but one of the gaps I see, I, I love what you're describing, this is the world I try to live in, is uh, having enough people who have enough expertise to do the architecture. You're, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. How do we grow them? Or how, yes. do we, how do we- Good, wonderful question. Yes. So let me go back to that first attack example, the stock exchange example again. The conditions we had here was we had on their side one person who I would consider good enough for being an architect. Average, not the best one, but not the worst one either. Yeah, average, one. But we had three other people, young guys, yeah, good developers. Yeah, so they were at that point where they say, okay, well, yeah, we understand. There has to be something like an abstraction. Yeah? But no idea, never worked yeah, in that field again. But that's what we had. So we had to work with those four people yeah, to get them to, to the point. What we did is we took the one architect yeah, and you know, sketched out you know, the, the, the big concepts you know, that need to be done. The other three people were sitting there and listening to it. They couldn't really contribute at that point. Right? But then their job was, now you take those concepts, to be just whiteboard things. You take that concept and do the detailed design in the tool. So they'll start learning UML yeah, and all the intricacies and what you can do and how you organize and all of this. And by doing so, they little by little learned how to take an abstract concept yeah, and make it work by doing just the design. It took them about three to four months. At that point, they were at that level yeah, where you can actually use them as architects. Yeah, again, average, yeah, not the best one. Yeah, but you know, pretty good potential. So yes, it is possible. Yeah, if you put in those feedback loops yeah, very quickly, yeah, give them a little work, let them do it, check, yeah, whatever it is, make corrections, next one, check, and so on. Yeah. Give them feedback quickly. It works well. And yes, of course, there will be some people where it doesn't work. Yeah. But mostly it does work. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Yeah. So th this one is um, more about um, you talk a lot about uh, tools for doing UML and everything in the infrastructure. There's a lot of documentation, tracking things, everything. So I guess that the question I have is, do you have any guidelines for how do you scale that up from in terms of what's a small project? I assume that these techniques would be applicable to a small project, ideally, mm -hmm. a way to learn. Mm -hmm. But where is the point where you start? Um, uh, and how and what's the process for growing into being on larger scale stuff? Yeah, that's a good. Effectively. Yeah, good question, and I can actually can answer okay. that question. So, of course, there is how you structure it. Um, yes, we have guidelines for you know a system like you know the, the, the trading trading system, which is about uh, half a million lines of code you know, in that that range here, and you know how you would do that in that in that context. And yes, you know, especially when you when you think in terms of UML tools, um, there is limits what you can do in scaling up. Yeah, theoretically you can get all the information in there. Yeah. Practically, you have to get it in in such a way that you actually find it. Yeah. Again, that's the the scalability problem here. Yeah. I can't say, I can't tell. You. I don't know. 
beside of let's break it up into systems and have you know different models you know for all the systems yeah that's the obvious one <laughs> other than that i don't know yeah uh, following up on this gentleman's question 